in the room ever financed a historic property, something that's on the National Register? Did you do it with tax credits? We did tax credits. Okay. Very hard time back working. Yes. And somebody told me once that the only trick to public speaking is to know more than your audience. <laughs> so I'm in good shape. I know more than everybody except one person. <laughs> so um, I've got about 35 years in banking. I'm one of the only idiots you'll ever meet that has a degree in economics. Don't ask me why. Um, kept going back to school. And then in banking, I've done a lot of different things. I've done real estate development myself. I've been a commercial lender. I've been a bank president. And I currently work for Southern Bank Corp Bank. We are a $2 billion in growing CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution and we have 50 locations in Arkansas and Mississippi. We're in Blondeville, <coughs> Helena, Marvel, in this neighbor, immediate neighborhood here. Um, we have an administrative office in Little Rock, um, up and down the Mississippi Delta, all the way to within 30 miles of New Orleans. So um, I'm in Arkadelphia where our headquarters is um, and I've done I was hired at Southern to run their nonprofit real estate company which at the time had um, low-income housing tax credit properties a uh, couple of historic tax credit properties and um, that was 15 years ago and have done a lot since then, uh, one of which was the development of the Federal Reserve Building in downtown Little Rock into the East M High School. That was about a $9 million project total, used historic tax credits for it. And I learned everything I know about tax credits the hard way. Um, initially, as a lender, loaning money, um, you know, one thing lenders do quite a bit of, more than you would think, is low-income housing tax credit properties. They do the interim construction financing and sometimes participate, depending on the, how it's structured and permanent, but there's always a local lender that does the construction financing, so I was fairly familiar with it. There's a pretty good-sized developer in Arkadelphia that I financed several times, so I knew something about tax credits. Managed tax credit properties for several years before I jumped in with both feet and started out with a $9 million development. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to anybody, but. Okay, is there anybody in the room that wants to finance a historic property or needs to? Okay. Take us down that road as if it, we it's <laughs> it's complicated and and I I'll talk about probably some of the things that you've heard but in a little bit different context. There's a big difference based on the size of the project. Um, and for some of you, a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars may be a big dollar amount. But in the tax credit world, it's tiny. The problem you run into is somebody has to buy those tax credits. And there's a market for tax credits nationwide. But it starts on projects that are probably $10 million and bigger. So if, if your project isn't that big, you're probably not gonna entice some investment group or syndicate out of Atlanta or New York to buy your credits in Pine Bluff or Little Rock or Arkadelphia. However, the other buyer out there is your local bank. 
in a former life, I used to be a bank examiner way back in the 80s. And almost every bank we went into bought tax credits. Why did they buy tax credits? To reduce their tax liability. And they bought things like low-income housing tax credits, and occasionally you see historic tax credits. The great thing about historic tax credits, they're the cleanest from an investor standpoint. Low-income housing, you have to take 10 years to use them, you have 15 year compliance period, you've got a 30 year deed restriction. New markets, you have seven years, and it's a lot more complicated. Historic tax credits are straight line over five years. That's the only risk the investor has. So they like it. You get to take 20% a year. So the first thing you need to do is understand that you're your loan is just a construction loan. Physically, it's not really any different from building a gas station or building your house. Um, but you add a lot of stuff to it that makes it really complicated. And you add some cost to it that you wouldn't have otherwise. Regardless of the size of your project, if it's $100,000 or it's $20 million, you've got to find somebody that knows what they're doing. You're going to need an architect, you're going to need an accountant, and you're going to need a lawyer. And why are you going to need all those people? How many of you work with nonprofits, or that's why you're here? Okay, nonprofits can't use tax credits. You're not eligible. However, on the project that I did, it's still owned by a company I'm, I'm the president of today, and I had to flip it out to a 100% owned C Corp subsidiary to take an IRS election. I can't remember the number. I have to call my accountant. That made it eligible for tax credits. So it's owned by a for profit company that in turn is owned by a non profit company. So most of us can't do all that by ourselves. So if you're with a foundation or a historic preservation district or any case where a nonprofit owns that piece of real estate that's on the National Register, the first person you're going to need to talk to is a good CPA that has some level of experience with tax credits. And if they don't, they can probably find, if it's somebody you're comfortable talking to, they can probably find somebody that does. The other thing you're going to have to do is understand that, and, and you may, I, can, I don't know what you all talked about this morning, but you've got qualified rehab expenses and it's 20%, all of your expenses aren't gonna be eligible. If you add a new parking lot that wasn't there 100 years ago, it doesn't qualify. They, they've all got a list of okay. qualified and non-qualified. Yeah. Yeah. And some of them may surprise you. There's some that do qualify that you wouldn't think would. So it's not going to be all of your costs. And guess what? If you go out and buy the property like I did, I spent a million and a half dollars on it. That's not eligible. That's an in, 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 ineligible cost. The acquisition price doesn't count. So you start at 20% of your eligible, eligible costs and then you also realize you're not gonna get 100% for the credit. And it's gonna depend solely on what somebody's willing to pay for it. If it's a big project, you can get a pretty good idea of what um, historic tax credits are going for nationally, and you're gonna get a price that's that's pretty close. If it's a smaller project and you're going to end up selling them in all likelihood to your local bank, 
you may get a little bit less, but you get to work with somebody that you know a little better, and it, you know, it may run from 71 cents on the dollar to 87 cents on the dollar. You know, there's a range. Any tax credit um, is always gonna sell at less than 100%. And I'm pulling those numbers out of thin air. I haven't looked at the prices lately, so. Eight, I'm getting 88 cents for very small tax credits. And that's fantastic. That's the best I've heard of. Yeah, and they'll do like 90% on like a $400,000 yeah. tax credit. Yeah, that's, that's better than it was 10 years ago, as a matter of fact. So that's good news. Um, another thing, and I don't think the big project I was involved on was the very first, but it was one of probably the first five that used the state tax credits. And the thing you need to understand about the state tax credits is your buyer has to have a state of Arkansas tax liability. And guess who typically does not? Arkansas banks. Because they are the biggest investors in tax exempt municipal bonds. The bonds that finance schools, water districts. So very frequently, your, the bank you use on the corner doesn't have a state tax liability. Larger banks like Southern, we have a lot more than we used to because of where we're at and the different types of investments we do. Um, but there's also a lot of out-of-state banks with interests in Arkansas that are very interested in those credits. I ended up selling ours to a bank in Southern Missouri that had some business interests in Arkansas and they just snatched them up. So there's a better market out there than there used to be. Missouri loves our country. Yeah. The loan itself, like I said, is just a construction loan, but you've got You've got some, gotta get in front of the phone. <laughs> you've got some obstacles that you wouldn't have otherwise. And if you've never done a construction loan, um, and I can tell you I've, I've been in this position before, somebody's come in and they're halfway through the project and they decide they need to borrow some money and I say, well, we can't do it. I don't know who's gonna lean on it. Um, don't know what you've done. We're gonna have to slow down and they get mad and so, that's kind of a, an extreme, but you need to start talking to lenders at the same time you're talking to architects and accountants and CPAs. It's never too early to talk to any of them. They may tell you, hold off a minute, you're not ready yet, um, get some other things lined out, but um, and, and you'll run into banks that are scared of it. Um, it's less common to find a bank anywhere that doesn't have some familiarity with tax credits in some form or fashion. Because again, it's like I said, it is just a real estate loan. It's just a construction loan. It's just got a couple of layers of complication added to it. Um, and I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I didn't bring a presentation. Um, and also raise your hand if you got a question. I don't care when you ask it. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't realize, you rarely get paid for the tax credits up front. It's gonna happen at the end. So if you're on a tight budget, um, especially if you're a nonprofit, you're gonna have to talk somebody into financing more than they're normally gonna do, knowing that the sale of the tax credits is gonna pay that loan down at the end. There's a good reason for that. Only your qualifying rehab expenses count so you really don't know for sure what counts until you're done. And 
prices change, timelines on construction change. And there's something weird about us lenders. We want everybody else to put their money in first before we do. That was a joke. Anyway. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, but that, yes? How does that five year time frame that you mentioned figure into this? Uh... You have a, and again, I'm not a lawyer and I didn't stay in a holiday in either, but I frequently <laughs> practice law without license. <laughs> you, you've got, you do anything for as long as I have you practice law without license, but, um, It's that 20% a year. You have different, you have oversight from different areas. You've got National Park Service, they don't care anything about the tax credits. They care about that, what that property looks like and what you physically do to it and that facade you do. They could care less about anything else. So as long as you don't put vinyl windows up on the front of that, they don't care when they come by and look at it. The IRS is who comes into play on that five year period. So if I buy your tax credits on your project, I use them up in five years. So at the end of five years, I'm done, we're done with the IRS, you're home free. That's what that five year period is. Once you sell those to me as an investor, and it's straight line, I take 20% a year for five years. And you as the seller, you get all your money up front. But I'm gonna come after you as the investor if you do something that you're not supposed to to that property within that five year period and cause a recapture event and that's a real word, recapture. That's when the IRS comes back and holds their hand out and says, hey, you, you broke the rules. Give me my money back. One of those rules is you can't sell that property. You certainly can't do anything that would cause a problem with the um, National Park Service and the manner in which they approved that that you can't property. sell the property for five years the same yeah. yeah yes but the physical things with the property too that makes investors nervous oh and i want to point out that um i know that you're talking about the nonprofit from a federal also point of view mm -hmm. um and i know i know of several a handful of nonprofits that because they did not want to jump through those federal hoops and having to do the for-profit arm, um, that they've only done the state tax credit. Yes, and that's, the, the state and the Fed are independent. Um, so you can choose to do one and not the other. If you're gonna do the federal, you'd be crazy not to do the state okay. because all your work is already done. But so if you were a nonprofit and you were gonna do federal and state, what would you say is the minimum investment to make it profitable? Well, I don't think there is a minimum investment. I think it depends entirely on how you control your costs. Um, architects aren't free, lawyers aren't free, and accountants aren't free. The great thing about historic tax credits is once it's done, once you've been approved, once you sell your credits, you don't have a bunch of ongoing expense or um, accounting fees or things like you do annually with the other types of tax credits. Um, so there's not really a minimum, but let's, let's just play around with the math. You've got a $200,000 project, you've got a 20% cap, so that's $40,000, and you're gonna sell it for 88 cents on the dollar. So that's your maximum. 
and then you're going to pay architectural fees of 8% on the whole project. And then you're going to pay $7,000 in legal fees. And you're going to pay your accountant $5,000. So that you wouldn't pay otherwise. So maybe you end up with thirty thousand well, dollars. So, and sign up not all of that's eligible expenses, so Yeah. Now it, it's not throwaway money. It's not throwaway money. You've been made a very good point. Architectural fees, guess what? They are a qualified rehabilitation expense. And a lot of your legal and some of your accounting fees are in there too. Um, for those of you that ever do get involved in the larger projects, spend the money on experts. What I would strongly suggest you do, if you get into anything at say a million dollars or more, you're going to hire an accountant and it's got to be one that's done it before and you're gonna get a cost certification at the end. And what they do, they've got experience doing it, they know what the rules are, and they certify your qualified rehabilitation expenses. I dealt with the IRS on the back end. One of the guys I know he's wrong, I could prove he was wrong, but it was actually to our benefit, so we let him write us up, so. But you don't wanna be in that position. You want to be able to hold up that cost certification to anybody that wants to buy those credits. It makes them comfortable. And you've got an accountant in your back pocket with a cost certification if you ever get audited. Has everybody scared to death of financing <laughs> historic tax credits yet? What if you, um, what if you get a state historic tax credit and you want to sell it and you can't find any banks, your local bank is not interested. How do you, what do you do just as? You call her and she'll find somebody in Missouri. <laughs> well, no, I know I have to say, but what do you well, do? Well, that, that's what you do. That's a good, you when I did it, when I did it, there was no market. Right. But you, there was maybe two people that had bought them. So I had to pick up the phone and start calling people. And I had called enough people that the bank in Missouri called me and said, how much do you have? We want everything. Mm -hmm. And guess who it was? Commerce. Yes, it was. Yeah. A lot of times Commerce and other banks too, they like go on the Park Service website and see who's done a part one. Yeah. Oh. And then they send cold call letters saying, we noticed you have a project at such and such address and we were interested when you were ready. Just, so. just like this group here is a fairly tight-knit community. Um, Y'all know who all, all the, my friend John Greer, all the architects are, who do this kind of stuff are pretty close. Guess what, so are the lawyers and the CPAs. So um, you're gonna start selling these tax credits the minute you start the project. You don't want to wait till the end and figure out who's going to buy them. And if you're doing a smaller project, one that's not going to be attractive to say an out-of-state investor or a syndicator, and a syndicator is just what it sounds like. There may be syndicators with the price that historic tax credits are at now that go out and buy smaller pieces. They pool them together and then other investors, it's extremely complicated, so I'm, I'm making this analogy a lot simpler than it is, but they form an LLC and they just start dumping tax credits into it. And that LLC is owned by other investors that need to take the benefit of those tax credits been done for years in the low income housing tax credit market and that's how it works with syndication. 
But again, it's easier if I can buy a million dollars or I can buy them $40,000 at a time, I'm, I'd rather get the million dollars. It's, it's just simpler. It's the same amount of paperwork too. Yes, and that, that's the problem. The paperwork, the oversight, the regulatory issues are the same for a $200,000 project as they are for a $20 million project. And that is very unfortunate, but it's the IRS. But at those prices, it has to be more attractive because the prices don't go up unless the man goes up first. It's the first time I've used my degree in economics in a long time. <laughs> so. Rachel, the first time I had a tax credit to sell, I did my own project. Mm -hmm. This is how I, because I thought it was a job. Um, I mean, I did, I just called banks all over Little Rock and most of them at that time, like 2010, did not know what I was even talking about. And again, like you say, it finally mm -hmm. makes sense now that he says that Arkansas banks do not need tax credits. Yeah. Um, and then when I finally did, I mean, I still hear that Bank of the Ozarks will pay like 77%, but usually it's to their clients. Um, and then the first time I sold my tax credit, I got 84 cents on the dollar. And then the next time I came back around with another one, then had yeah. found Commerce Bank or they found me, whatever. So now I refer most of my clients to them. Southern Bank Corp buys tax credits. And we finance projects. We have new markets tax credit allocation right now for the first time. So um, again, Talk to your local bank. I'm gonna leave some of my cards up here. Give me a call if you want to. They don't let me loan money anymore, but I can hook you up with somebody that does. So some of the bank corps are non-profit itself, isn't it? No, it is not. We make as much money as we can. Um, we, we are a CDFI, which is a, a Community Development Financial Institution as designated by the Treasury. What we do that's different is, I'm a stockholder. We have a big case off and uh, our other stockholders are not your traditional stockholders. They may be the Rockefeller Foundation, the Walton Foundation, some of them are even other banks and we don't, we have different classes of stock and we don't, they don't make a lot of money out there investment in us, but we turn around and do things that other banks don't do. And I'm not gonna lie to you, every bank that is in a small town in Arkansas does community development, they all do. But we focus on it, that's what makes us different. We have a nonprofit affiliate, affiliate Southern Bank Corp Capital Partners, they're also a CDFI and they are a nonprofit. They do some things that we can't do as a commercial bank. But we make as much money as we can because we pay dividends to our holding company, which in turn passes money down to our nonprofit. So, I know it's different, I just wasn't sure how. It is. And again, it's it's kind of complicated, but that's the that's the elevator speech on on what we do. Does anybody else have questions for John? You can track him down with some cards and information later. And you know the bad thing is, I think I brought enough for everybody to have one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Do you have a branch in Colorado? We do. Okay. Scott Fife is a buddy of mine. I've known him for as long as I've been in banking and he runs our El Dorado office. Thank you, John. Thank you.